Join me today for the repair, restoration, and testing of my Sansui G9000DB receiver. One of the most beautiful receivers Sansui ever made, and maybe one of the most beautiful receivers ever made by anyone. If you enjoy vintage audio equipment, you've come to the right spot. Please subscribe and hit that notification bell, as well as giving me a big thumbs up if you like this video and share it with others. There is a risk of serious injury or death from electrical shock working on this equipment. If you're not comfortable with working on the equipment, please do not take the cover off and consult a professional. A little background on the Sansui G9000DB. It was manufactured from 1978 to 1979. It's rated at 160 watts per channel into 4 or 8 ohms with a maximum distortion of 0.03%. It's a full featured receiver, has two phono inputs, AM, FM, two tape monitor circuits, its tone controls are bass, mid-range, and treble with separate turnover frequencies. It will accept two sets of speakers, and as I said before, it's a very nice looking receiver. I find the history of the individual units interesting also. I've only brought it up in one under other video, my Sansui 8 vi video, that I asked the person I'm buying it from what they know about it. Because once that's lost, it's lost. And I find it interesting, the story. And this particular unit I purchased from a gentleman who came home in 1979 from Japan. He was in the service. And he stopped in Hawaii. <laughs> he picked up a Sansui system. You know, now this is the only piece he's got left. Uh, he bought Sansui everything, a Sansui cassette deck, a Sansui speaker, San, uh, Sansui receiver, so everything on a turntable. So everything was Sansui. I find the history interesting, and I've seen your comments down below in some of my videos where your equipment came from. So I'd be very interested in those stories to include those down below, because I find that very interesting. The equipment that you have right now, where'd it come from? This Sansui G9000DB came home with a serviceman. He was coming home and he was bringing home a stereo too. And I won't go on and on about it, but I just find it very interesting and I find out every piece I purchase if anybody knows. Because sometimes it's like this. Uh, the gentleman was in the military and so I, I got the story there. I've purchased items from widows. Unfortunately their husbands have passed and they tell me the story behind the equipment and boy have I heard some stories how much they cared about this equipment. And I, and I can't go into it here, you know, and I don't want to bore you guys who could care less <laughs> either. So, so anyway, I, I just wanted to bring it up and uh, that I find the history and not just repairing them and not just listening to them. I kind of like the whole package. So hope you guys will down below tell me your stories. All right, so let's move on. The first assembly I'll be working on is the F2809 power supply and protector circuit board. The power supply is probably the most important piece in a vintage receiver. And many times this is the board that's under the most stress in any vintage receiver. So I'll go ahead and get those old electrolytic capacitors out of there. In addition, I'm going to change all three Omron relays. Before unhooking any cables, you want to take some pictures. Also, you can mark the cables if that works for you. It doesn't matter. The whole idea is to get it back together correctly. Once you get the cables unhooked, then there's just four screws holding the power supply in. It'll come right out. There's enough slack in the board so that you can get it into a position to work on it. So that's nice. What you want to do is use a tie wrap, use a little clip-on light. I'll be using my Hakko 808 desoldering tool as I always do. Notice how much smaller the modern capacitors have gotten from the ones I'll be replacing. I've got three brand new Omron relays and those will go in there. Uh, there's also some bipolar capacitors that I'll be changing. 
There's even diodes that I'll be changing in this unit, which is unusual, but some are, are known troublemakers and they need to be replaced. I won't be replacing any of the transistors on the power supply board, but I will be putting some new thermal compound on. This completes the F2809 power supply restoration, and I've reinstalled the power supply back into the chassis. Before we move on to the next assembly, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about electrolytic capacitors and their lifespans. You should change them or you shouldn't change them, or you should change some of them. The one thing that I see missing out there, you know, whether you're for it or against it, it's a lot of personal opinion. It's my technician said, it's in my experience, it's, it's all these things that, that have some validity, but in today's world, you can go right to the manufacturer's websites and they'll tell you all about the design of them, the testing and validation of them, and the reliability of them. You know, you don't have to go to some forum and some guy says do it or don't. Go to the manufacturer. And if you Google electrolytic capacitor lifespan, you'll come up with all the manufacturers and also some of the um, part suppliers that provide links. Like here I show a link to Illinois Capacitor and gives you a little idea of, of what they're going to talk about. And these are the people that are the experts. And here I show, you know, a link from Mauser, a big parts house, but to Elna. They were a big supplier of uh, capacitors in the 60s, 70s, and 80s for uh, Japanese uh, vintage equipment. And they'll tell you everything you wanted to know and even more. Here's Nishnikon. They're on there. Every series they make is on there. Here's Illinois Capacitor giving you a little brief two-page kind of here, we condensed it. This is kind of like um, electrolytic uh, capacitors for dummies. Okay, to wrap it up, you can probably see I'm kind of in the camp of uh, changing out those uh, old electrolytic capacitors. Um, it's hard to argue, for, from my standpoint, with the people who manufacture the product, who design the product, who test and validate the product. All the information in today's world, it's great. It's all online. 40 years ago, 30 years ago, you wouldn't have been able to get this. Somebody would just told you something and you would just either agreed or disagreed. There's no way for you to, to really uh, do any research of your own. In today's world, uh, all you got to do is go to Google and... Um, you can find out everything you ever wanted to know and a lot of stuff you probably didn't want to know about uh, electrolytic capacitors. It's time to move to the F2810 tuner power supply now. I have to remove the F2799 tone control assembly first to get to it. In this unit, there's a separate small power supply for just the tuner section of this receiver. Uh, once again, it was pretty easy to get to and take a couple screws out. You know, you get a little bit of slack in those wires and you've got plenty of room to change out those 40 year old uh, electrolytic capacitors. Give yourself as much space from the wiring as you can. When you have this stuff dangling, you know, you've got wires all over the place, it's just a good idea to keep them out of the way a little bit, one way or another, either with a tie wrap or just pushing them up. So I went ahead, changed out those uh, electrolytic capacitors, and I've reinstalled the uh, F2810. It's time to move on to the F2799 tone control assembly. That was the assembly that I had to pull out so I could get to that um, F2810 tuner power supply. One thing a little bit unusual on, on this particular assembly, it has a shielding cover, and that's not really the unusual part. The more unusual part is that it's soldered onto the F2799 tone control assembly. So you have to unsolder three tabs 
and then the cover will come right off. Not a big deal, but you know, normally they're screwed on, and this one isn't. Now with the cover removed, able to get all at all those old electrolytic capacitors, no problem. Again, this assembly's like the rest of them. It's pretty easy to uh, to work on this board. There's enough slack in the cables to where you can get to everything fairly easily. This assembly has many bipolar capacitors in it, and they should be changed just like electrolytic capacitors should be changed. I've mentioned this before, but using tie wraps is a great way to have the third hand when you need it. You can put the assemblies where they're easier to work on, and if you need a different angle, you can just cut a tie wrap, move the assembly, and just tie it back up with a new tie wrap, and it just that works out pretty well. It's very helpful, and as I've mentioned before also, bending these wires back and forth is a concern, and you don't want to do that too many times if you can help it. So I've got the uh, capacitors changed out, and I'm ready to reinstall the assembly. I'll use deoxit to clean the controls in this G9000DB. After 40 years, it needs to be done. And with deoxit or any cleaner that you're using, exercise all of these controls 30, 40, 50 times. I know it sounds excessive, it sounds ridiculous, but you don't want to get this back together and have an issue. The pins on the connectors, take a look how dark they look. You can clean those right up with an eraser and they'll look brand new and they'll stay looking that way. I've done this for years and they'll stay looking like they left Japan 40 years ago. With the faceplate off, clean up the chassis. Again, this is something that hasn't been done in 40 plus years. And you can clean the faceplate with warm water, dish soap, same thing with the knobs. It's been a long time and they probably need a good cleaning and who's going to get in here again? Once I got everything reassembled, it was time to give it a try before I completely reassembled the uh, receiver. You don't want to get it all back together and have a problem, so I tried it on the test bench. It worked fine. It looks great. And I'm really excited uh, that it's starting its next 40 years. We're going to take it to the test bench here and put it through its paces. I've got my Sansui G9000DB up on the test bench. I'll be using it today with my signal generator as well as my Sound Technology 3200A audio analyzer. I always bench test my equipment after I restore it. It just validates all the work that's been done and makes me confident that when I listen to it, it's as good as it could be. It's as close to a new one coming out of the box in the late 70s as there is. Here I'm just seeing how well the two channels track together. Here we're running, you know, a little over 28 volts. I'm just turn I mean, uh, watts. I'm just turning the uh, volume control to see how well these channels track together. We're 39.3 and 38.9. I'm turning the knob again. Uh, they're darn close. I'm just turning it up here. See what we get to. We're running now. Let's take her up over a hundred per channel. And there you go. Running 139 on the left and about 135, 136 on the uh, right. Uh, it's going to turn it down here. Won't keep it up there all that long. So that's very good though. Right now we're sitting on the left channel and we're running just about a watt, a hair over a watt. So I'm going to start uh, turning up the volume here and let's see what this uh, 9000 dB can do. Just a couple turns on the volume control. We're at 8, 12, 19, sitting again just about the same distortion just under 0.02 27, 37, 
50, 51, 66, 75, 95, 131 continuous right now at under 0.02. Pretty impressive. Okay, I'm going to run up the power here with the volume control till I get close to what it should be able to put out. And then I'm going to go up here to the uh, signal. There's 161. Well, we're doing over 172 at under 0.2. Uh, pretty damn impressive. Okay, we're over on the right channel now, running just about a half a watt or so. And I'm going to start turning up the volume some here. We're up to uh, 48 watts a channel. Here we are running at uh, 0.02, or under it, 0.0175. Um, we're at 72 watts continuous, under 0.02, 87. I will move over to the signal, 172. Let's try it one more. 174 at 0.02. The G9000DB did great on the test bench. As a hobbyist who repairs, collects, and restores vintage audio equipment, there's one thing I like the best, and that's to listen to the audio equipment. That's what got me started many decades ago, and what I still go back to. So when one of my projects come off the test bench, it's going into a system, and I'm going to listen to it. This Sansui will be here in another 50 years. In 2070, somebody will have it in their stereo system. I truly believe that. The engineering, the build quality, and time has already shown. These pieces of equipment, given really limited attention, can go and go and go. Unlike today, when something breaks, you throw it away. You put it in the garbage. Down in the comments, I hope you all will share your stories. As this piece of equipment came home in 1979 by a gentleman coming home from Japan after serving in the military, I'm sure you all have a story too. But love to hear your story down below. I read all the comments every single one, and as i shown you with this unit, I love the history of the individual piece. I keep all that information because once it's gone, it's gone. So I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, I'd appreciate a big thumbs up. For you non-subscribers, if you like this video, please subscribe. For my present subscribers, as always, thank you so much. And I hope you all have a good day.